So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, February the 10th, and this is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 195. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is the way to be. So I'm really glad that you're here. The, the weather took a bad turn on us. Uh, lots of wind, rain, and it dropped down to 35 degrees Fahrenheit. What's that in Celsius? Minus 2 Celsius, and we're getting 36 mile per hour wind gusts, which is 56 kilometers per hour. So we have a tough situation. I went out there this morning and what happened? One of my beehives blew over. That's right. And that demonstrated the value of using chipping straps on your beehives, even though sometimes we like to put weights and rocks and things like that on them. And sometimes I do both. And so uh, I'll run that video at the very end. It's not fancy. It just shows that Number one, the bees are alive. And because they didn't have liquid syrup in there, liquid syrup, well, syrup would be liquid. But uh, because there's no syrup in there when it fell over, just a dry fondant pack, easy to put it right back in line. The bees were up near the top and the bees were down near the bottom. But of course, uh, when I tipped it up, had to wear your bee suit. Here's the thing. You might think because it's cold outside that the bees are not gonna sting you. I highly recommend a veil at uh, the minimum for protection because even in the cold weather, 35 degrees Fahrenheit, windy, gusty, overcast, bad time for the bees to be on their side. Could I have left them there? I could have, but I have skunks and stuff roaming around at night and I think it makes it too easy for them. So now it's back upright. So glad I did it. Uh, let's see if you wanna know what we're gonna talk about today, please look down in the video description below and you'll see all the topics listed. And if there are resources and links, and there will be links today, not necessarily affiliate links either, just links to information and resources. Um, what else? If you wanna submit a question of your own, then there's a link to my website, thewaytobe.org, and the page is The Way to Be. And I've rearranged that page. You used to get there and you had to look at iron-on patches and things, which is a way for you to support my channel, for example, but I shifted it around. So now when you go to that page, the first thing you see is the form. And someone wrote to me and said, ah, oh, the form looked little. I didn't think I could write down everything I wanted. The information that you write on that form is unlimited. So it might look small on the space on the website, but it's good to go. You can type in all your stuff. And uh, then that means that we might talk about it. So let's get going. Let's see what's going on today. So the first question, number one, comes from Tom from Campbell, Ohio. How are the weaver bees holding up and have they requeened and stayed strong? Thanks. All right, now this comes into play. And I'm glad we're talking about this because a lot of people are thinking about getting their bees for the first time this spring. And uh, there are ways to get your bees. Packages can be shipped through the mail. Nucleus colonies generally have to be picked up in person because they're heavy. And uh, you can also buy in queens if you have existing colonies, but maybe you're just not happy with your bees, their production, their wintering, something like that. Or maybe they're prone to disease and you'd like to change that a little bit. Um, so when I do buy in queens, uh, I'm, rare, I'm very good now at getting my own queens and doing walkaway splits and using resource hives to build queens and uh, provide backups for the colonies so that if they come queenless, then I can uh, pull one out of there and get them right back on track. But let's say I have to buy one. And when would I do it? I buy them when it's a time when my bees wouldn't be able to make their own queens. So this happens kind of at the end of the year and I, the reason I'm explaining it this way is because it's not straightforward. Oftentimes we think, well, we'll buy these uh, known genetic queens and we'll put them in our hives and then uh, we'll keep those genetics around. And if you're a small time backyard beekeeper, small scale as I am, I only have 23 colonies. It's not reasonable to think that I could, for example, requeen all of them and then impact all of the other colonies of bees in my area. Just can't, there's other beekeepers around. I have a beekeeper 500, 600 yards from my house. I have no idea what they're keeping or how they keep them or anything else. So the minute they swarm out, and this is gonna happen in spring, you could lose one of your brand new queens. And so then you need to mark them too and keep records so that you know if this is the original bee weaver queen or whatever queens you've got, 
Uh, but when they fly out, you've lost them. And then they mate with drones somewhere. And uh, the old queen leaves and she starts a new colony in another cavity somewhere. And then so each time they reproduce the colony, a new queen flies out, gets mated. And even though the new queen is from that great bee weaver queen or carniolan or whatever you have, um, we've already diluted her genetics because now she's mated with other drones and so we have other stock and then so it goes and that's why rather than focus on that i would say if you can at all try to use bees that are already performing well in your local area so if you've got uh, no bees and you need to buy something in uh, you can always go to man lake or someplace like that man lake tends to broker bees from uh, Oliveras County, for example. So they have the Saskatras Sask bees and a lot of other lines. So when you buy them in, you can have them shipped to your house. But if you can go with local stock, if you can collect swarms in spring, because they're all gonna be swarming, um, you'll have good stock from the previous year. I say this a lot. But uh, for me, why do I then buy any queens from Bee Weaver? And uh, the reason is the same reason I buy purebred chickens from Murray McMurray Hatchery, the largest rare breed hatchery in the United States. It's because I pick breeders and for birds or for the honeybees that I want to support. Uh, I like what they're doing with their stock. They're survivor line bees. They perform well here, even in the cold. And uh, they've been treatment free for decades. They're a multi-generational beekeeping family, the Weaver family. And uh, so when I buy in a queen, I get something that's mated, ready to go. They are um, great survivor stock and they perform extremely well. Uh, so I'm casting my financial vote to perpetuate that company. That's why I buy it in. And so I know that maybe a year or two later, I'm gonna lose that queen and uh, so her offspring that reproduces will be watered down. And But if we're watering it down, hopefully it's with locally adapted, well-adjusted, top-performing bees that have produced their own drones and they're mating with my virgin queen. So now we're watering them down, but we've got genetics that are locally adapted that are going to do well. So do they stay strong? Yeah, as long as they're in the hive and they don't fly out and then they don't replace themselves through supersedure or swarms, which is the most common replacement for them. Uh, once they produce the swarm cells, you can't count on what they're going to do. They're even going to look different, by the way. I photograph all my queens, but what I would like you to do this year, if you've never done it before, and for those who are beginning, when you buy your queens, uh, whether it's local or you're flying them in or whatever, uh, please make sure they're marked and that you identify them. So take their portraits with your phone. Uh, note all their traits. And then that way you'll know halfway through the year or when you get into late summer, depending on where you live and there's a nectar flow on, if they superseded the queen or if they swarmed or something, you're gonna know, because now look at this colony, it's got an unmarked queen in it. Lost my queen. Keep records. Very important. But that's why I buy the Bee Weaver line. Now, would I, for example, because I know somebody may be thinking this way, what if I took every colony I have and in spring pulled every queen and got rid of them and installed a bee weaver queen in every single colony that I have? Now, that means that uh, later on when they start producing their drones, because that's the genetic outreach to the local community of other bees there, is when they send out their own drones, which come from the queen. And... Uh, once we're doing that, then yeah, I would be kind of saturating the area with some of those traits, but they have found, and this is the frustrating part of keeping bees, the most beneficial traits, the hygienic traits and the varroa resistance and things like that, some of those traits are the first to go. Uh, so that's why your record keeping is so important, looking for mites, other issues. Any brood or problems that you have in your hive, you should document and that's a queen that's a candidate to be replaced. And you can do that. That's one of the reasons that you want to inspect colonies and identify brood issues early. And a spotty brood, not strong brood, maybe she's not laying. And 
we're comparing with other colonies that she should be doing as well as, and if they're not, candidate to pull the queen and start fresh with somebody new. Now, here's the other part of that. Let me just throw monkey wrenches everywhere. Let's say you just pull your queen out. And it, for here, let's say it's late May, early June. Great time to be producing new queens. Lots of drones in the area, lots of resources, lots of nutrition coming into the hive. So let's say you got rid of your queen right then. Just let them make another one. Wait, won't those offspring be exactly like the queen that you just got rid of? No, because only part of their genetics are from that queen. Remember, when they emerge from the queen cells, they're going to mature, and then they're going to fly out, and they're going to mate with drones of other colonies that we don't know anything about. So we're mixing that up. So you'll get back a different queen, hopefully one that might have favorable traits too, because they did, after all, come from colonies that wintered. Let's move on to question number two. Oh, look, I just realized there's no name on this, but uh, Northeast Florida, USA. Do you know an easy and inexpensive way to externally mark a hive for status? This would enable easy way to remember a summary of the last inspection. I couldn't attempt writing in a notebook with propolis honey-covered leather gloves on. I'm imagining a two inch tall barber's pole on the brood chamber with multiple flat sides like a hexagon, including a color code system, one for queen status and a separate one for the treatment disease status. And I was thinking about implementing an interchangeable colored card to each hive, but I see issues with extra items being lost and moisture in a bag not being a long lasting solution. Other tubers do hive top brick placement, flat, vertical, horizontal, and so on. That does not give me enough options. Any insight you would be willing to share would be greatly appreciated. So this question lands right in my lap because, and why anonymous, from Florida, USA. Anyway, because uh, Bohemia Bees. I was talking to them at uh, the Hive Life Conference. And this was the cover shot for today. We're looking at these little dials and each one of these settings is a queen condition. So let me just pull the cover off. This goes on the front of your hive and you would of course turn the dial to show what you found when you did the inspection. So these are called status indicators. I'm going to put a link to this at the bottom. Queen right dial is what they're called. And then, uh, so this right now is just for queen status. But when I was talking to Jason, he was saying that uh, they're going to create inserts for this. And these are all weather inserts, so they should hold up really well. But uh, they'll have other ones to show other different types of status. So you could have a couple of these on the front of your hive. And then uh, you'd have different status indicators, you know, amount of brood, drone presence, things like that. Who knows what they're going to come up with. But once the system is there, little screw goes through the middle and it's got a raised edge here. And you'll be able to turn the dial around to all these different indicators and do away with your brakes. So I was glad to be able to uh, mention the queen right dials and we'll put a link down below. And I have to admit that Jason gave those to me at Hive Life. I was really glad to get them. And what a great opportunity to share about it. So that's one way to do it. The, I like the barber pole idea, but that's another thing that sticks up. These will be flat against the hive. You can have them on the side, the back, the front, wherever you're going to normally look to see how things are going. And please back up everything you do with uh, logs, log entries. Question number three comes from Peter Sheridan, Wyoming. I'm never sure what to do with surplus honey frames that have crystallized within the hive over winter. The honey can't be extracted and will the bees ultimately consume the semi-solidified honey in these frames? They seem to prefer to utilize almost anything else, including their fondant. Can I use these frames as a food source in my splits or should I just put them out in a remote open feeding station and let the field bees clean them up? Now this is something a lot of first time beekeepers are gonna be facing and maybe they haven't thought of solutions for it. 
But what we're talking about is the same honey that we extracted in the fall, but remember, we leave a bunch on to get your bees through winter. Honey that cools off, for example, when it's nice and warm, by the way, it doesn't crystallize, see? So in the winter time, when these extremities, the frames of honey that are out away from where the cluster is, they're pretty cool. In fact, they're similar to the outside temperature. And uh, they'll crystallize in the cells. And just as described here, if you go to uncap them, I'm sure a lot of people have run into this when they wait until spring, as I often do, to pull surplus honey and then cut away the cappings and then use that in your extractor and then collect honey in the spring because we know they don't need it anymore. And the second part of this is when the new nectar flow comes, guess what they use first? Their fresh honey. So the nectar that's coming in, cells that are still open um, because they cap them once the moisture gets low enough, usually around 18 or 19 percent, they'll cap their cells. And uh, once that's done, they'll continue to consume the newest first. So old honey can sit there in the frames for long periods of time. Now, this is kind of interesting. If you've left honey like that and uh, summertime showed up, now you have to expand because they're going to be filling new resources with honey. This is what bees do. They're hoarders. So they keep adding more and more honey and it's up to you to add more supers to accommodate it or remove the frames and make room that way if you're trying to keep your boxes small. So, but I noticed when it warms back up, the crystallized honey isn't there anymore. Hmm, why is that? Because it gets into the 90s in there. Because once the warm weather shows up, what's brood temperature? 94 to 97 degrees. So, inside the cluster when it's cold and the brood is there, uh, they're keeping that center nice and warm. That's why we don't find crystallized honey in that area, if they migrate over the honeycomb, it gets reliquified re with the warmth of the bees and the cluster. So the honey that's outside the cluster might be set or crystallized. So you have options. I agree, the bees are not gonna use the old honey in spring unless there's some huge dearth that shows up and you get a lot of rain and things like that and your bees have not provisioned themselves before that happens. You can pull it out and you can rewarm it too. So right now I have a drape that's sitting 25 feet from me, has a dehumidifier in it and racks in it. And I have a super of frames in it right now. Guess what I can do? Turn the dehumidifier on, <clears throat> excuse me, let the frame warm up. And I have a humidity and a temp indicator in there that I can check with my phone. And I let it get up to about 105 degrees and let it stay that way. And now it's important to have it also dehumidified because uh, honey is hygroscopic and can draw moisture in. But you know what we'll do? Just as with jars that you put in warm water, hot water on your stove and so on, you can remelt the honey in the frames in the cells because the melting temperature of the honey is well below the melting temperature of the wax. So if you take it to 105, if you don't care about, you know, the sensitive aspects of the honey and everything, you can bump it up to 110, something like that. But if you really want to retain all of the raw traits and you want to do as little damage as possible to the honey, but you want to liquefy it, try it out. Put that frame in a space where you have some temperature control and climate control humidity wise, and you can heat it up. Now, let's say you don't want to do any of that you don't want to play with it and you just want to cycle it back to the bees because you can't uncap and who wants solid honey in comb to eat. Uh, you can, you put it out at your feeding station and here's what I do also. I put it in big totes like the hive butler totes and uh, I carry those frames out there and I leave it in the tote and I tip it up on its side. Why do I do that? Because once the bees get in there and they start eating off the caps and other things are going to show up, so expect to see wasps as well. Uh, they'll start uncapping and eating it and uh, little puddles will accumulate on the bottom. So sometimes the bees will get stuck in there. That's why I tip them up on their sides. And then at nighttime, I go out there, I collect them, I put the lids on and I put them in storage overnight. So I don't leave them out. And that would let you even put them on the ground if you wanted to, but remember your dogs and everything else are gonna go after that uh, sugar. So a picnic table makes a really good feeding station, for example. And uh, 
then it will, they'll clean them up right away. Your foragers will get out and then they're going to get that and come right back and uh, reconstitute that into honey. And it's uh, one to one for them. So they're getting all the benefits of it and uh, getting it right back with very little processing and they're likely to use it right away. Just as I mentioned before, the uncapped cells get used first. So if some of them never even make it to the storekeeper bees. So when the foragers come in with the leftover honey that they've gleaned from your offerings at your feeding station, which by the way, needs to be well away from your hive. If you have prevailing winds, consider this. You want to put them upwind of your apiary. Hmm, why is that? Because the bees fly out empty. So flying against the wind empty is an easier task than flying against the wind full. So when the bees fly out and they get the load of, because uh, they'll even overdose. Sometimes you'll see bees, they'll fill up on so much honey. Uh, their abdomens are fully extended. Their honey crop is full and they're heavy. They're 30% heavier. And uh, next thing you know, they're landing on the ground and they actually have to recover a little bit from being gluttons at the feeding station. But it's much easier for them to fly back to the hive, back to the colony um, with the wind. So that's something to consider. Also, while I'm talking about that, because I think about this kind of stuff a lot, if you were setting up your apiary for the first time and you've got land and there's orchards or there's you know a predominant nectar source that you know the location of, if you can do it, the same logic applies. Put your hives downwind of the source that your bees are going to primarily be servicing. Uh, again, so that they'll fly back heavy. And I have lots of slow motion sequences that show how really overloaded they are and they can barely make it back to the landing board and another bee hits them and they go to the ground and they can stay on the ground for a sustained amount of time. And then eventually they get the energy back up and they go and they make another approach and try to get in. This is stuff that we don't see when it's normal speed. Everything looks like it's going great. But these heavy bees, heavy with pollen, heavy with nectar. But in this case, they wouldn't have the pollen. They would only have the honey that you've laid out from the previous year. So feeding it back to them works also. So those are just some options to think about. And good luck. So question number four comes from Tim, Elkhorn, Nebraska. I have a few hives and give my honey to friends and family. Is it safe to extract honey from a hive <clears throat> that dies over winter. It's generally safe for people, absolutely. Um, but you do need to know, and this is, again, because I'm talking to some new beekeepers. Some of you are coming into your first spring. And I know we can say, get a mentor out there when you're going to inspect your hives to look at the brood and see what the condition is. Do that autopsy on your hive and see why your bees died. So we're looking around. Often people are just going to find out they had no queen that there was no evidence of brood in there. Uh, other people are going to find out. Please listen to this one because it was 35 degrees right now. Um, if it's cold outside, please don't open your hives. You get the potential for chilling the brood. Now, if it's a strong colony and they're wall-to-wall -wall bees, which would be rare for me this time of year in my apiary, but let's say they're wall-to-wall -wall bees, they could take it. Because that means they have surplus workers, sur surplus warmers for the brood, heater bees, their thorax heats up. And not all the bees are doing that, by the way. They're little spots of heat. And so there are definitely bees that are very good at that. And they burn themselves out warming things up. But anyway, when you pop the lid and you let the cold air rush in, if the colony is smaller, if the cluster is smaller, they can still make it. But you provide a huge challenge when you lift the lid off just because you want to see them. And it feels like a warm day to you, 55 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. So you pop it open and you, for a sustained amount of time, you're looking at everything. Please don't do that. Uh, a smaller colony can still make it, but they're challenged when the brood gets chilled, even for a moment. And you might not see it right away. So eventually you'll see dead brood dragged out when spring comes onto the landing board, or you could cause the colony to expire. And others may say, so what? They weren't making it anyway. Let them die. Um, but if, it, if the cause was you, you know, I'd rather not be the cause of a colony dying out. But um, 
So we don't need to know what's going on in there right now, but we need to know why the colony kind of died before we pull honey and uh, start sharing it with other colonies, which is the number one thing people like to do. Let's pull honey from the dead out and put it on this new swarm that I just collected. So we need to understand what brood disease looks like and what different um, things that you might find on your brood frames and your honey frames to see why they died. So that's a segue into two booklets that I want you to think about getting. This little one is called A Field Guide to Honey Bees and Their Maladies. And this is put out by the Penn State Extension Office, extension.psu.edu. And what's good about this is, and uh, we can set aside our pride a little bit. If you're a beekeeper, you've been doing beekeeping for so long, you just know everything about the bees. This is a great refresher because there are excellent pictures and explanations in here of conditions you may find in your hives. And I don't care what time of year it is, good visuals and good explanations. Oh, and, the, and I just flipped this open without a marker and what's right on here? Chilled brood. So chilled brood is an event that you cause. So just don't open them. Don't inspect when you don't need to. And let, I mean, here's even, they even show what mouse nests and stuff look like. Okay, so that's one book I highly recommend. Look, it's pocket sized. You're going to the doctor's office or something. You're going to the dentist, which everybody looks forward to. You need something to read while you're sitting in the waiting room. Now here's a bigger book from another group that I like. Now, I paid for these, these weren't handed to me. So this is not a, a paid endorsement or anything like that. This comes from the Bee Informed Partnership, Diagnosis and Treatment of Common Honey Bee Diseases. And this is the second edition. So I want you to pause and write that stuff down. Every beekeeper, new or old, or even thinking about it, should have these books. These are not expensive. This is the back of it. I think the photographs as well as the explanations are extremely important. Problems with brood of adults, sack brood, and things like that. We hear these names. It's one thing to hear them and have somebody tell about them. It's another thing for you to see these crystal clear pictures. Highly recommend it. I'm going to put links to these, of course, down in the video description. I used to buy bunches of these and then give them out to people when I gave talks and things like that. But uh, how to test your bees for hygienic activity and things like that. Chewed down brood. So these are fantastic. I don't want to over talk about it, spend too much time, but I hope that you will get these. If you know a beekeeper and you want to give them a present, those are great books to get. Honeybees and their maladies. And of course, the Bee Informed Partnership Diagnosis and Treatment of Common Honey Bee Diseases, second edition. If there's a third edition, get that one. So know what you're looking at, and uh, but 99.9% .9 of the time, safe for people if you're going to pull your honey from a dead out. Because foul brood can be transmitted through honey that has no impact on humans, it has an impact potentially on bees that you might be transferring those honey frames to. And also, if you're going to put them out, as we mentioned before, at a robbing station or something like that, then you should know what the visual indications are of different brood disease that could be passed on when other bees go to rob out those frames. And this is why some areas don't even allow open feeding of uh, honey and resources for your bees of any kind. It's because of the risk of spreading those diseases to other colonies. So... Question number five comes from Herschel Chittenango. I hope I said that right. Chittenango, New York. I'm looking to make some woodenware from lumber cut on a buddy's bandsaw mill. My question is, will the lubricating fluid used in the milling process be toxic to bees? Because it's winter, we will be using windshield washing fluid or RV antifreeze, both of which state they are non-toxic. 
I'm trying to experiment using six by four lumber for five frame brood boxes and three quarters, three by fours for three by fours for supers. I have two already and they seem to be working so far as winter in zone 5B. Okay, so when things are labeled as non-toxic for bees, doesn't necessarily mean they're non-toxic for people. But here's what I'm trying to think about. And keep in mind, this is just going to be my opinion. I can't give you an absolute on this because I've not researched, um, you know, how much antifreeze is going to make it onto the surface of the wood and still be there when you put it together. So you've got antifreeze and uh, wash window windshield washing fluid. Um, Cause there's a lot of different windshield washing fluid formulas, but I know that they have a lot of alcohol in them. Some of them do. Maybe it's uh rain X who knows what that windshield washing fluid is, but here's what here, here would be my take on it. If I'm looking at those and thinking, is there noticeable moisture still left on the surface of that? And then we have to think about how honeybees interact with the surface of the wood that you're putting in there. And here's what I would, hopefully do like when I do my own hives and I'm building my own stuff this spring, uh, particularly my nucleus hive boxes. And that's just because I have piles of lumber. It's rough cut, like really rough cut. I don't know what they used on their saws. I don't know what the Amish use uh, on their saw blades and things like that. So I don't know that any of us know what's been used. And then there's something called when you look at lumber, and this is, these are from the Navy days, S2S, F3S, S4S, surface three sides, two sides, or surface four sides, so they're smooth sanded. So I would think if you had some concerns about the interior surface only, um, if you thought that there really was some residue there that could be harmful to the bees, I don't think there's gonna be, but if you really wanted to go an extra step, you could uh, sand that down a little bit and remove some of the rough cut. But then, in my opinion, you defeat a rough surface that your bees might be using to propolize. That's why I wanna make my own nucleus boxes this year out of this rough cut lumber that I have. It's all red oak, by the way. Uh, I wanna see the bees propolize it. So I'm gonna say, I don't know of any concern for that because we have to think that not a lot of it's really, we're not dipping it, we're not spraying it. It's only being used on the blades to make the cuts. And so how much of that, if it were enough to really soak into the wood, um, I would think that, that that fluid would be just dripping off of the blades. I mean, when we see, you know, metal cutting band saws, they have cutting oil and it's constantly flowing across that stuff. It's not the same, I'm guessing, you know, when it comes to wood cutting the wood because that would cost you a lot because you wouldn't be recycling it the way they do in machine shops and stuff where it runs through a filter and circulates back through and gets recycled to the cutting surface. Uh, so I'm gonna guess. Now, here's a part two. We probably have a lot of lumber workers out there. Beekeeping and lumber working kind of go hand in hand. What are your thoughts on that? How much of it's gonna be on the surface of the wood? How much of a detriment do you think that's going to be? Uh, I don't think it's gonna be heavy because they may walk over it, but I don't think the contact is enough to transfer it to brood, which would be the most sensitive part of the hive uh, to where it would be a big detriment. But if somebody wants to disagree and open a discussion about that, I always welcome debate and discussion about anything I mention. <clears throat> so no problem. Now this one I almost tossed out, by the way. Number six is not a question, really. It comes from Keith in St. Louis, Missouri since I'm from Kirkwood, Missouri, originally, which is St. Louis County. Fred, you seem to have a lot of spare time on your hands. Have you thought about taking on some additional hobbies or pursue other interests to keep from being idle and being a pest around the house to your wife? Okay, well, um, <laughs> the reason I was gonna toss that out is because I work seven days a week. And, uh, and then I realized, I think that's a joke. I think he's making fun. I think it's kind of like saying, way to go, genius. You know, and like somebody spills a cup of milk or something. They don't really mean you're a genius. It's actually used opposite of the term. So I think he actually means that he knows I'm super busy, 
and uh, that I'm not idle in searching for new things to do and fill my day. So, thank you for that though. And my wife has not yet complained, at least not to me, maybe to her friends, but she's not complained about me harassing her. So question number seven, moving on, Vicki from Maysville, North Carolina. Here's my question. It says, I purchased Hive Alive Fondant on your suggestion. As I was thinking, it would be a good way to feed two new packages of bees due to arrive mid-March here in coastal North Carolina. The weather will be in the 60s and 70s for the most part, and we'll have lots of trees blooming, or at the end of their bloom. The hives are near a large pond for water. You frequently speak of fondant in the winter months, but would it also be a good fit for new packages in spring? All right, now you guys can do anything you want with your fondant. Just in, just in case there's a miracle out there and somebody is, does not know what fondant is or what the Hive Alive fondant looks like, this is it. But uh, now I don't know if it even says on here that it's specifically for winter. I use it for winter. Uh, they don't tell you exactly what time of year you should really be using it for. But here's the thing. I'm going to talk about what they do. So fondant in winter time. And I was very glad, by the way, as I mentioned earlier, that it was fondant that was feed on top of that hive that blew over. Just one out of 22 colonies. Um, because it's so easy to just put it back. But we're in winter time. Now, so when you get a package, what is your package doing? They have to forage and they have to build their own comb. So when you've got this new package of bees that you're installing, it, it's literally that. It's a Sometimes it's a plastic bee bus or it's a wooden cage with screen. And uh, when those bees come, uh, you're going to put them in a beehive and they need to draw out comb. Now, they do that really well and they do it because they're fed syrup on their way, I hope. Not that gel that was shipped a couple of years ago with the packages that killed most of the bees. Um, the fondant is less efficient when it comes to building comb. And I think that's why we tend to use it in the colder times of the year. And again, it's an emergency resource for your bees. It's not their primary resource. So what we're doing when we get a package is, um, and some people don't even like to feed packages. I do. I want them to stick around and I want them to start to build infrastructure fast. And if they can get uh, sugar syrup in the, in the hive, then they'll have that resource right there. So even if it's raining, for example, because it happens, uh, we've installed packages with a light drizzle outside. It might even be a little cold to be installing the packages. But uh, when you have syrup, they metabolize it immediately. So sugar syrup, one-to-one, -one, that's not even critical. But the sugar syrup hydrates and gives them moisture and helps stimulate them to produce new beeswax. And so by providing that resource, it also gives them the energy they need to stay warm. Beeswax isn't produced unless the area where they're producing it, where they're drawing out the cells, unless that's warm too. Usually it's in the 80s. So they have to warm the area that they're working and uh, everything else. So I don't recommend Hive Alive fondant or other fondants for a package of bees when you're first installing them. Now, you said packages. This just hit me, by the way. Two new packages of bees due to arrive mid- Okay, here's what we do. Let's create a competition. Here's what I would like you to try out and then share it with us. And for others that are getting packages that have leftover fondant or whatever you do, put Hive Life fondant on one of them. Put sugar syrup on the other. And uh, see which one builds up faster if they build up exactly the same. So the fondant we know is good for a couple of years, so you would still have it for next year, but uh, let's make a competition. So orient your, your hives that you're putting your packages in, same way, south facing, try to make as many of the parameters the same as possible, and uh, put sugar syrup on one, put Hive Alive fondant on the other, and then say go, and then sit on your chair and watch them. We could have a competition on our hands, but I think, I think the syrup will help them build their comb faster and the colony will build quicker. 
Remember that the queen can't lay eggs until she's got cells to put them in. In fact, that, that's another funny thing that I've watched bees do in observation hives, no great surprise. When they're drawing out from heavy wax foundation, so that's the other thing, you know, what's the fastest thing that they could build off of. Heavy waxed plastic foundation tends to be drawn out really fast. You can also alternate those. So in my brood area, I like to have foundationless frames, by the way. But what I do is I alternate a foundation, no foundation, a foundation, no foundation. So the no foundation is just a wooden frame. They have to build it all completely. That uses more resources. So also configure both of those hives exactly the same. And uh, so the heavy wax foundation, they tend to build that out faster. And if you're really in a pickle, um, I save this in reserve for later in the year when I have a late season swarm or something like that, but better comb. Uh, better comb has already drawn out synthetic beeswax and gives them a place to put nectar and resources right away while they uh, continue to build comb on other frames. And I do that the same way too, every other frame. So do it, see what's happening, see what goes faster, and then don't forget to report back. So this is from Vicki Maysville, North Carolina. Create a competition, see what happens. That's how I, those are backyard fundamental experiments that end up informing us and keep records. And I just see how it goes. And I think everything's gonna be great. Now what would I recommend uh, for your feeder? Oh yeah. For your hive top feeder, don't forget uh, the bee buffet. These are what I'm trying out this year. They sit right on top of your inner cover, insulated inner cover or not. They fit on small mouth mason jars or large mouth mason jars. And that sits right in here. And then your bees come right up through the inner cover and they feed in this little trough up here. So for your sugar syrup hive, I recommend that you try that out. And then this sets over here and that prevents your bees from getting out over here where your uh, jars are gonna be. Quart, half gallon, small mouth, large mouth, whatever you wanna do. This is what uh, I'm gonna use this year for those uh, small, like nucleus hives. I can put these right on top if it's just a swarm or they need a boost, something like that. The Bee Buffet, and you can probably Google that. I've mentioned them before, and I'm glad I thought of that right now. So sugar syrup, fondant, go. Okay, here's the next question. Number eight comes from Ed, St. Charles, Minnesota. My question is about cleaning hives after a dead out. Some beekeepers use fire, some use bleach. I don't want to use either because I have poly components in my hives. Can I use the oxygen disinfection that brewers use, such as One Step or Star Sand? So here's the thing, uh, disinfectants don't do what we need them to do when it comes to polystyrene, but guess what? I'm no polystyrene expert. I don't know diddly about that stuff when it comes to reconstituting it. Uh, so I've never reconditioned a polystyrene hive, but guess what? So here's what I do. I Google around, I do YouTube searches. So that leads me right in today's shout out for how to reconstitute your polystyrene hives and materials. The YouTube channel for today's shout out is Black Mountain Honey. And the title of the video is How to Sterilize Poly Hives. Now this video came out five months ago and I was very impressed. So I'm gonna put that link to that video down in the description, but you can also just search for it. Black Mountain Honey, did a great job. Made those things look like brand new. And don't forget to tell him that I sent you. Question number nine comes from No Name, Northeast Florida. Curious about bottom boards in relation to hive conditions, how they are affected by temperature and humidity. I've come to understand that bottom boards should be solid or have removable trays. I'm concerned about using solid bottom boards when our summer temperatures can reach 125 degrees Fahrenheit or higher 
and the humidity can exceed 90%. My agricultural bee inspector recommended open screen bottom boards all year round and maybe adding an insert if the temps are to go below freezing for an extended period. I did have an issue using removable trays in my first year where wax moths were breeding between the screen and the plastic insert. I'm curious to hear what your opinion is on the subject matter and hope it isn't a redundant question. I'm about a dozen episodes in. Okay. So here's the thing. <clears throat> this is something that you could consider regional, you know, so hot areas here in Northeast Florida. Uh, but here's the thing, your honeybees, if they have access to water, will handle and manage an enclosed cavity that uh, has even a very small entrance. We can talk to people that uh, have found bees in feral cavities in uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, these southern states, high humidity areas, high temperature areas, and uh, the open screen bottom board I'm just going to call it. It's not necessary. Um, and I did that originally, but here I am in Pennsylvania. I don't have the temperatures that uh, you're going to hit down there. Uh, summer temperatures can reach 125 Fahrenheit. Um, if I had that area, I would be using some kind of light canvas or screen stretched over my beehives so that they would not get that kind of sunlight and heat. But here's what I do know from those who have tested, uh, stress tested honeybees. And they did that without the screen bottom boards. They wanted to find out what they could really handle. Now that's not our job to find out. We don't want to push our bees to extremes and just see, well, did they make it or did they die? And let's find out where that limit is. That can be very hard, but the information is useful. So when we find out that the bees can do extraordinary climate control inside the hive, now we're assuming the hives are healthy, the colonies are strong and so on. But uh, they tested them on volcanic surfaces, so in Hawaii. And they had very high temperatures and obsidian. I don't know if you've ever been on a, a lava flow, not active lava, but a lava flow area where it's nothing but obsidian. And of course, that acts as a heat battery. The sun's pounding down on it and uh, it superheats. The bees sustain themselves with a single entrance in that environment as long as they had fresh water available. So now on the flip side of that, I used to use screen bottom boards to open ones with nothing underneath when I first started beekeeping. So I had solid and screen because it's always kind of been my approach. If I don't really know if one's going to be better than the other, uh, I try both. So, and then we just look to see over time which one outperforms the other. And as I've mentioned before, uh, the bees wanted to seal up the screen. So they tried to propolize it. That is not a natural cavity for your honeybees to be in. Now we could argue that and say, well, a honey beehive is not a natural cavity for your bees to move into. But bees voluntarily move into beehives. You'll get uh, colonies uh, moving into beehives that are just in stored on shelves. And when we set up uh, swarm traps, for example, uh, we have entrances for the bees and the bees voluntarily move into them. So we're seeing what the bees make choices about. So I'm using the bees to make my case for me. And how could I do that? Well, if you set up swarm traps, and we know that the ideal size for a swarm trap is about a single deep 10 frame or a five over five uh, nucleus box, because that's the same kind of interior volume of the space and statistically, that's what the bees would prefer. But uh, of course, they might in some cases move into a larger space and in other cases move into a very small space like the Texas Bee Works uh, beekeeper. She found bees in a birdhouse that had moved in. So, but one of the things I want you to try out to find out what the bees would occupy, because here's what we do. We, we catch the bees, we get a swarm or we get a package or we get a nucleus and then we put them in a hive and then we configure it the way we want. So we don't often know what the bees would choose. Now, put up a swarm trap and have one of those swarm traps have an open screen bottom to it. And then put another identically configured swarm trap as far as the interior space goes and have a solid bottom board and a single entrance on the front of it 
near the bottom. See which one of those have identical entrances and everything else. The only difference being one is a solid bottom board, one has screens as the bottom board. And then see if your bees will move into that open bottom cavity. And I'm going to suggest 99.9% .9 of the time, if they have an alternative space to occupy that's completely enclosed, that's the space they're going to select. And uh, I didn't ask uh, Randy McCaffrey or Mr. Ed, Jeff Horshoff, between them, they've done over 1,500 cutouts for bees from structures. And I would bet uh, that if we ask them, we're not going to find very many that the bees moved into that had open bottoms. Uh, there might be, you know, on occasion, because sometimes bees get in a pickle and they'll even start building their comb on an open tree branch. They've even done that here in the state of Pennsylvania. What that means is they had no options for a protective cavity to move into, and uh, they started building their comb right where they were. And so they will do it if they have no other options. So if you left your bees, for example, in the package that they come in, in that screen package, and you left them there for days, you're going to find that they start building comb even in that. They had no choices because they're trapped in it. So, <clears throat> and now I'll give other reasons for why I don't like the open screen bottom board with no containment below it. And that's because it has to do with the flow dynamics. It has to do with the way bees manage air, the way they arrange their brood. So when they have a single entrance, which again is what the bees have preferred and demonstrated their preferences for, for as long as I've been looking into bees. Uh, they control the airflow and they orient their brood around where that airflow is located. If you have a full open screen bottom board, um, they don't have control over airflow. They just don't. Uh, when you get these gusty winds, it's going to blow up in there. And of course, if there's no top entrance, it's not going to blow up and through. But now if you combine that with an upper vent or an entrance, if you're in a really hot climate, I'm just going to guess that some people do vent there. Now you have a constant airflow that the bees, again, have no control over. So what would be the plus side of it? Well, one would be part of integrated pest management. If you had an open screen bottom board and varroa mites were to topple through it, they're going to go all the way to the ground. And assuming that your hives are well off the ground, see, I don't even know what that configuration is going to be, um, then that would be one benefit but I don't think the bees would prefer it. So I do like screen bottom boards with a removable tray and an enclosure around it. See, I don't even like the first um, flow hive or the standard basic flow hive that came out. The bottom board has core flute insert in it. And then uh, the screen bottom board, which is really good. And it was straight screen, not like the, um, the plus versions that have aluminum sheets with cutouts in them. So it had the screen and I like that, but uh, the core flute got stuck all the time. And there were, other, there were other issues with it. I wanted it to be enclosed and I wanted a tray because the other thing is when we're doing inspections of hives, let's think about that. We have a screen bottom board, nothing under it. The option to put a sheet under it for winter time as described in the question. When we pull apart the hives, sometimes we disrupt uh, honey cells. Sometimes they're going between the boxes and as we pull things apart, honey drips down and through. Now, if the honey dripped down onto a solid bottom board, uh, the bees could reclaim it and that's good. So there's a vote for a solid bottom board. If it went through the screen and into a tray, we also have it. We've got that under control. And that's why I often recommend before you do an inspection, clean your tray inserts first and then you'll know it goes down into it when you do your inspection. Also, looking at what's in the trays is very interesting. Great way to know kind of what's going on. I'm not too worried about wax moths breeding or being present or wax moth larvae in the tray because that's not in the hive. And uh, it's just natural for them to be cleaning up that detritus. I like finding little critters down there. So, um, if you drip honey through a screen bottom board with nothing underneath of it, you're going to kick off some robbing potentially. So there's another vote against the open screen bottom board. 
Uh, the other thing is when the nectar flow is on and there's lots of honey harvesting going on, we know that uh, your bees are getting attacked by robbers, potential robbers at the entrance because that's where they smell all the honey coming through. But if they're dehumidifying their honey and condensing it down and you have an open screen bottom board, I would expect to find a bunch of bees collected on that bottom screen trying to get in through the back door some way. So, and that doesn't mean they can get in there. It just means their tongues are going to be sticking up through all over the bottom, trying to get a hold of some of that nectar and trying to find a way in. And it attracts more bees to that opening. So there are a lot of things that I see as negatives <clears throat> for that bottom board. Yeah, I thought I had one handy. I guess I don't. But, uh, so me personally, what's my choice? No screen, bottom board, unless it's enclosed, has a tray so you can access it, remove it, clean it out. So that's it for today. I would like to see comments from people that have, what do you think of what I said about the screen bottom board? Does that make sense or not? Um, Dr. Jamie Ellis said you get a 15% mite drop uh, just having a screen bottom board, but I would like to have a tray or some removable slide in there. All of my observation hives have screen bottom boards now. Uh, another bonus for a screen bottom board, but again, don't forget, I want the tray in there and I want it to be enclosed underneath. Uh, condensation in the wintertime that's running down the interior sides of your hive uh, can go now into that tray uh, and into the bottom board in wintertime. And so they don't pool directly on your solid bottom board. But you can make comparisons for where you live. Uh, you're a backyard beekeeper, you can have options, different bottom boards, and see if you can make observations that match up with what I've described. So that's it for today. This is the fluff section. I want to thank the Los Angeles County Beekeepers Association for inviting me to talk with them via Zoom and give a presentation. That was a really great group of people out there. And uh, don't forget that when the weather's warming up now, you're here in the United States, it's time to get out there and start inspecting on the warm days. Look at your landing boards, see what's going on. Uh, this is a crunch time for starvation for some of the bees. And uh, we want to make sure that they have what they need. And it can seem like they have plenty of honey off to the sides and you can do inspections. Uh, if it warms up enough, they can get around to all of that honey. But if the cluster has now risen all the way up underneath that inner cover, and uh, the surplus honey is in the number one or the number 10 position or whatever size hive you've got. Uh, they often this time of year frustratingly will not budge and go over to those. Why? Because they're starting to brood. We're in February here in the state of Pennsylvania. And that's why having a fondant pack right on top or your dry sugar or some carbohydrate resource for them is going to be very important right now. Uh, and they'll still, when the, when the weather warms up, they can move around and then they'll access that. But right now their focus is on protecting their queen and of course the brood that is supposed to be starting up now. We still have a long row ahead. And the other thing was, uh, check your hives. Spring storms are no joke. Uh, we had a bunch of rain come through and soften up the ground, even though it's really cold outside. And that's why the one, the one flow hive uh, blew over and it had shipping straps on it, so it didn't come apart. It just went on the ground, and the bees are alive in there, so at least I know that. And then I just used the straps to stand it right back up and put them right back in business, so they're good. Um, animals are coming out of hibernation, so if you've got an electric fence around your apiary, good time to be checking that out, making sure that the grass and stuff is not, you know, grown up leaning on it, that there aren't tree branches and things like that, uh, taking away the power from your electric fence. Going to my third year without an electric fence, uh, using noisemakers instead. Total risk, these are my noisemakers. This is one right here. Solar powered, they're all out there. I hear them go off, they only come on at nighttime. These are the loudest DBs I could get and they go off when a squirrel goes through or they go off when uh, the skunk who's visiting every night right now is out there. And they go off on deer. Deer don't seem to care about them. But uh, the bear do not like noises. So I've taken down my electric fence and I'm just using noise. I'm not saying you should do that. If you do, put lots of video cameras out. 
so that you know when motion's going on and if something's out there coming after your your hives and of course keep them zip shipping strapped together sometimes that can uh, help when the bear comes and tries to pull things apart or raccoons even try to pull lids off for years i never saw that happen uh, but shipping straps foil raccoons too with their pesky little feet but the raccoons did not like it when these noisemakers went off so <clears throat> oh yeah if you're going to be pulling apart or if you're at your fifth year or sixth year of beekeeping and you're going to be pulling out some of your old brood frames in spring before your uh, queen and brood start moving back down to the bottom uh, don't forget to go ahead and order frames that you're going to need or foundation if you use it i like foundationless in the brood uh, so i you know i don't buy a bunch of that but you got to have frames handy it does uh, take up a lot of storage space, but think about stuff like that. You don't want to find out at the last minute that you don't have anything to put in your hive if you're going to pull out old frames or frames that don't look right. Follow these books, Honeybees and Their Maladies, Diagnose, Diagnosing and Treatment of Honeybees. You find these conditions, you got some work ahead of you. Um, so anyway, and... Uh, Colonies are moving around, so that's it. Think about positioning your stuff for spring, and when you're going to open those things up, even on a cold day, make sure that you wear a veil, have some kind of protection, because the few bees that do fly out, they're ready to let you have it. So I want to thank you for spending your time with me today, and I hope that spring is bringing good things your way when it comes to your bees. And if you have any questions, of course, visit me at thewaytobee.org and click on that page and submit your question. Thanks for being here. Have a fantastic weekend.